everyone. Um, our second honorable guest for today is Mr. William Byramian. He is a proud citizen from Glendale, California. Mr. Byramian holds a bachelor's degree in political science and international relations from UCLA, and he received his master's degree from the prestigious Ivy League School of uh, Columbia University. He um, has worked for Shell Trading's Gas and Power Division in San Diego, and has also worked on Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign as a regional field met director in California, Texas, and North Carolina. He is also the former um, executive director for the Army National Committee of America, um, the Western Region, just to name a few things. Um, this past year, uh, Mr. Bayramian launched the Army Night website, which is an online periodical of Armenian news, culture, politics, society, and history which showcases of art and, art and literature, all written with a higher standard. Um, this past, um, a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of having Mr. Bayramian as my group leader um, at, for Advocacy Day in Sacramento. Um, please, everyone, give a round of applause and a warm welcome for Mr. Bayramian. I didn't send her any of that, so we did a lot of research, a lot of good research. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the CSUN ASA for having me here and for inviting me to speak alongside uh, the honorable guests, Amir Zara Sinanyan and Congressman Adam Schiff. It is uh, a pretty great honor for me to have, uh, being the youngest among them. Um, I was at CSUN last year as well, and the event was slightly different, but uh, nonetheless important. And I want to commend the ASA for the work that you have been doing, uh, uh, Alina, the President, and the whole ASA. It's not just the people who are leading the ASA, but also all the people who are involved in organizing these events. So um, I commend all of you for putting in all the hard work. I know how difficult it can be while being full-time students, so a job well done to all of you. Um, I'd like to get started by asking everybody in here, uh, how many among you think that a genocide didn't happen? You don't have to be shy. <laughs> um, or maybe you want to be shy. Uh, the, the, the fact is, and the reason that I'm asking that question, is because uh, the response in this room is reflective of the response that you might get in many other places. That's including in the United States Congress. Uh, even the last time that the Armenian Genocide Resolution was voted on in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, not the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which took place recently, but the House Foreign Affairs Committee vote that took place a few years ago, when the Armenian Genocide Resolution came to a vote, uh, uh, there were people who voted against it, but almost nobody during that vote denied the Armenian Genocide. Almost everybody, even in voting against it, acknowledged that a gen genocide may have taken place, I'm sorry, did take place, but it may not be the best time to be uh, passing a resolution that might uh, annoy uh, uh, supposed ally in the Republic of Turkey. Uh, of course, that's not to talk about uh, that ally not allowing us to use uh, their uh, base, which is which happens to be built on uh, Armenian lands, whenever that's necessary. That doesn't speak to, of course, that ally banning Twitter and YouTube whenever it sees fit, uh, or it doesn't apply to that ally acting undemocratically whenever uh, uh, they think it's appropriate. Uh, the point is that acknowledgement of the genocide, recognition of the genocide, affirmation of the genocide, whatever you want to call it, is done. Okay. Everybody knows that the genocide happened. You all know, members of Congress know, most of them, and if they uh, dare to de deny it, they won't speak out about it because they know how silly it might sound if they were to say that I don't believe the Armenian Genocide happened. I don't believe that two million people uh, uh, just disappeared into thin air, which is the uh, line that the Republic of Turkey takes and many people in Turkey take. 
And the reason that I'm uh, bringing that up is because you're at a very important point in history where the genocide and the work that has been done in order to acknowledge the genocide and recognize the genocide, very important work that's taken place over the past many decades, is transitioning into something else. This thing keeps getting in my way. <laughs> but I'm sure you can all hear me without it, right? Yeah. 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 You're at a very important point in history where you don't have to work for recognition of the genocide. That doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to work for the remembrance of the genocide. What you're doing here and what's been done year after year in remembering the genocide is just as important as working to rec have it recognized. The point is that you are able to do something different. You're able to take the next step beyond uh, genocide recognition. And since you talked about uh, Advocacy Day, which was a few weeks ago, and some of you in here went to Advocacy Day, I think you know that that transition has already started taking place in a lot of uh, different arenas. One of them is in the state capitol, for example, in Sacramento, where the ANCA every year goes up and takes hundreds of activists with it to go and advocate on uh, Armenian issues or issues of concern to the Armenian American community. This year, as I'm sure any of the participants uh, who came up would be able to tell you, there was no question of recognizing the Armenian genocide. You're not talking to people who, are, who don't believe that a genocide happened. You're talking to people who know a genocide happened. They are affirming that the genocide happened. They are remembering that the genocide happened, as they do every year. But we're moving beyond that. We're talking about genocide education now, okay, to ensure that future generations understand what happened during that time. So that it's not just you know, this, this um, nebulous idea of you know, recognizing genocide, but let's talk about what happened before the genocide. What led to the genocide? What were the consequences of the genocide? Who were the people in the genocide? And that's uh, what I'm going to focus on, which is that we're moving from the concept of genocide as a word, as an idea, which, is, which was very important to acknowledge over the past several decades, to the nuances, to the people, to the things. Genocide, after all, is a destruction of people and things, right? And when you see movies like uh, grandma tattoos, which some of you may have seen. When you have studies being done by Turks and by Armenians uh, about the riches and the treasures that were lost, stolen, I shouldn't say lost, lost is a euphemism. Okay, they were stolen from uh, Armenians during the genocide. When you have people actually talking about those things, you're moving beyond genocide recognition. You're talking about the effects. You're talking about the people. You're talking about the things. And uh, that's the direction in which I think a lot of the work is being done, and that's the direction in which I've been working recently. Uh, that was uh, part of the idea behind uh, establishing the Armenite, was you have this thing that a lot of people know about. You know about uh, the one and a half million people who died, who were massacred know uh, that it started on April 24th. You know that there were 200 intellectuals that were rounded up and uh, killed by Turkish authorities. You know the, the names of the cities and you know some of the churches and uh, the places. But who were those people? When you say uh, Tanya Varujan, you say Siamanto, you say uh, uh, Ahtamar, you say Van, you say, uh, what do those mean to you? Who were the 200 intellectuals who were rounded up and killed? And I think that in trying and moving toward an understanding of who, who those people are, remembering what was going on at that time, 
reading the things that those 200 intellectuals were uh, writing and speaking about is how we are going to uh, uh, move beyond where we have been. And the reason that I think that that's important is because once you start doing that, you'll understand how important it is uh, uh, today. As you uh, all probably know, there were uh, the Armenian National Movement had begun in the 1800s. Right? Uh, the Armenian National Movement, which had uh, the objective of establishing an Armenian state. fighting for Armenians' rights because they had been oppressed for so long in Turkey. And I want to read you a quote from uh, one of the commanders in the Ottoman Turkish military about what he said after uh, uh, massacring the population in Sasu. His name is uh, Zeki Pasha. In 1894, he said, not finding any rebellion, we cleared the country so none should occur in the future. So, not finding any rebellion, uh, not finding uh, actual fighting on, on the part of Armenians, they decided to wipe out the Armenian population anyway. When you read what many of the Armenian uh, authors and writers at the time, and intellectuals at the time, uh, were writing, they, they, they kept encouraging uh, the Armenians to stand up for themselves, to defend themselves, to fight for themselves. And uh, the Turkish authorities had very uh, well understood this. And part of the reason why the Hamidian massacres happened in the 1890s was to stymie that uh, national movement. And what happened was that before it was able to uh, reprise, before the national movement was able to reprise the momentum uh, and actually establish a free and independent Armenian state, as was envisioned, uh, they committed the genocide. But in doing so, in doing all the, in all the years that preceded the genocide and even the Hamidian massacres, we had uh, a corpus of intellectual uh, thought that had developed, uh, which is almost unfathomable today. And the reason that it's unfathomable is because we don't know much of it. So uh, the reason that I'm having this discussion with you is because most of you, not all of you, and um, all, with all due respect to the older people in this uh, audience, but uh, most of you are young and uh, most of you are just beginning in your uh, careers and your lives and your uh, education. I want you to think about not just genocide recognition and affirmation and acknowledgement. I want you to think about how you're going to learn about the people and the things and the places of that time that were lost because of the massacres and also what the consequences of those massacres, what the consequences of the genocide have been because we've spent the past 99 years learning all those things all over again because of how completely decimated the Armenian people were. And with that, I am going to leave you with one final uh, piece of advice that I found in doing some of this research There was a man, his name was uh, Magardich Kharimyan. He was the patriarch of Constantinople. He was known as Kharimyan Haidi because he was so uh, loved by the Armenian people at the time. And he, uh, speaking in the 1870s, this is 20, over 20 years before um, the Himidian massacres where hundreds of thousands of Armenians were massacred. encouraged the Armenian people to stand up for themselves. And he was a, he was a very powerful man, and unfortunately uh, he didn't live uh, long enough to continue 
the struggle. I mean, he was he was already old, but uh, he nevertheless left us with many many uh, very deep and important thoughts, which we could learn a lot from today. And in doing uh, research about him, I had heard about the iron ladle. How he had gone to a meeting and he had said, "If I only had, if only I had an iron ladle, the Armenians would now have a country." Uh, I couldn't find any uh, translation of that. I could only find one, and that was one in English, and none in Armenian. I couldn't see. I couldn't find it in Armenian anywhere. So I found it in a book at UCLA's library, uh, which was crumbling. I took it out of the box, and as I was turning the pages, the, the paper, well, the pages were crumbling in my fingers. Um, only recorded. Um, it's one of the only places that the speech is recorded in literature. So I translated it, and uh, I think the last sentence uh, is something that we can learn a lot from. He says in his speech, Before all else, place the hope of your liberation upon yourself. Give your mind and arms strength. A person must depend on himself in order to be saved. Thank you very much.